Amen. Well, that, uh, that will conclu- uh, conclude our time of uh, communion today. Uh, it's great to be together. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for sharing uh, just a little, you know, a little window into your life. And uh, we m- wish you many blessings uh, on your next chapter back uh, in, in Colorado. Uh, it's been a great weekend. I uh, enjoyed and also survived the Lake Day myself. And uh, the Sunrise Baptism was awesome. So proud of CJ. And uh, it was just great. It just... It just felt like we are family in God's church. Uh, That's really how I felt yesterday, and so thank you to all those uh, who worked so hard to put that together. Uh, If you're new to us, welcome to our church family. We hope you feel love. We hope you especially experience God's love today in its many various forms. My name is Forrest, and uh, my wife and I work in the ministry here in the Phoenix Church, and uh, we're starting a new series today, as you can see on the screen, uh, called Identity. And we're asking a very important question that we all struggle with and we all think about in life. And it's that in the little search box there, who am I? I don't know if you put that in Google, what will happen? Uh, That would be interesting. I don't know if Google answered that question personally or answer it for you, but uh, scary. Um, but, But so many things come at us these days that try to define who we are in our society, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And a lot of those answers to who am I have very little to do with actually who we are at the end of the day. Uh, And so we're going to be looking kind of foundationally at two kind of ideas with our identities the first few weeks here uh, under this idea of truth and lies. We're going to look at the truths uh, that God's word present to us about our identities And then we're looking at some of the lies that really creep into our lives uh, through this world that can really mess up our view uh, of ourselves. You know, millions of Americans are very concerned with the security of their identities. You know, who here has had a a bank account hacked? You know, who here has has had someone pretend to be you on social media? Start a new account in your name, you know? Who here has has identity theft insurance? Yeah, quite a few people, you know, because... Because, you know, back in uh, 2017, uh, Equifax, one of the leading credit companies, was hacked. And 143 million people's information was exposed, uh, you know, leaving many people feeling very vulnerable. And a lot of people before 2017 didn't think about their identity, you know, in a digital sense and weren't really that concerned about monitoring it, but it took a crisis, right, uh, of that proportion to wake people up to uh, that reality. In a similar way, It often takes a personal crisis for us to really think about who we really are. You know, the the last few years, uh, you know, the pandemic and and political and social strife, I think, made us all question and search more deeply, uh, you know, and ask who who we truly are. And and this series will be really a a, a study, a journey to help us really wrestle with with who God created us to be and how that that matters today in our everyday lives. Uh, So it will be very theological, but it will also be very practical, hopefully, uh, in that journey of you finding your true identity in Christ. Amen. And so Genesis chapter 1, we're going to go back to the beginning and look at uh, God's intent here in Genesis chapter 1 and how it can teach us the truth uh, of our identity. And today's going to be much more about truth uh, than lies. Next week we'll look much more at the lies. In Genesis chapter 1, we're going to start off just looking at the first five verses here, and then we're going to just kind of uh, summarize a little bit of the rest. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first book in the, in the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, it concludes, the first day. And then you go on uh, to the second day. Uh, And I have it kind of summarized here for you on the screen, but you can follow along in the text or look at the screen, either one. Uh, the second day is verses 6 through 8, and there it says basically that, you know, there, there was a vault created that, that God called the sky, and that was, you know, again, evening, morning, and the second day. Verses 9 through 13 is the third day, and God basically, you know, creates the land and the seas, it says, uh, on the earth uh, on the third day in verses 9 through 13. And then it, and then it says uh, at the end of that, in verse 10, God saw that it was good. 
And that phrase shows up a lot uh, all through uh, this passage. Again, in verse uh, 12, God saw that it was good as he starts to produce the vegetation on the land and the seed-bearing plants. The fourth day, verses 14 through 19, uh, it says, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs. In verse 14, to mark sacred times. And God makes two great lights, of course, the sun and the moon. And also it says in a very huge understatement in verse 16, the stars. <laughs> and again, verse 18, God saw that it was good. And that, of course, is the fourth day, the fifth day. God starts to create living creatures in the, in the water and in the air. And it was evening and morning in verse 23, the fifth day. And on the sixth day, God starts to produce living creatures on the land and on the ground. And again, verse 25, it was good. And then let's pick it up together here in verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then, verse 29, God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And the vegans say, Amen. And in verse 31, God saw all that he made, and it was very good. The only time that phrase appears, it was good is all over this passage, but it was very good, it says in verse 31. On the sixth day, God made humans, and he said it was very good. And then it concludes, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And in chapter uh, 2, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Most scholars today agree that Genesis chapter 1 is, is very poetic in its structure. It's very poetic when you look at it from a literary standpoint. Uh, and so sometimes we can approach Genesis from a literal standpoint, you know, one day, two day, three day, four day, for example, or, or a scientific standpoint. Well, if, if you have plants, then you have to have sun and all, and all those kinds of, of things. But, but when you look at Genesis chapter 1, th those actually are problematic viewpoints, to take it literally or to take it scientifically. First of all, I don't know if you noticed, but a day in, in Genesis chapter 1 is the evening, then the morning. Scientifically, we see it the opposite, right, uh, today. Second of all, plants are created on day three. What day is the sun created? Day four. So that, that doesn't make sense to us either, right? Thirdly, uh, the only way we've ever measured a day in all of human history, as far as recorded history, has been the movement from one perspective uh, of the sun right, right in the earth. But the sun is not created until the fourth day. So it raises the question... What are then the first three days? When we say day, what does that mean? If the sun wasn't even created till the fourth day. So Genesis 1 as, is more a poem about what happened in creation and who was behind it. Not on how it all can be explained. That's a whole other matter. And I say all this because we, we live in a Western mentality, a, you know, a Western educational viewpoint, a Western philosophy that is all about here is a truth and now here are all the reasons why you should believe this truth but genesis comes from a eastern way of thinking which is very different than the way we think in the modern western world and that's a lot of the way the bible is actually written it's written more from an eastern viewpoint and the eastern viewpoint of learning is more about discovering truth through stories and pictures before the printing press, none of us would have been able to have Genesis chapter 1 in our hands. You know, uh, it was a very much an oral tradition. Think of Jesus. What did Jesus, what was one of the main mechanisms Jesus used to teach? Parables. Parables, right? Because there are stories, so the oral, the oral learning could occur. And Genesis chapter 1 in many ways is, is designed, I believe, as you look at the structure here, and we're going to do that in a moment, to tend toward that as a poem. And the structure is quite interesting. In verses 1 to 2, God begins creating, right? The first line there on the screen. 
And in verses, uh, sorry, days one through three, God starts to separate. He separates the light from darkness in day one. He separates the water from sky in day two. He separates uh, the land and sea in day three. And then in, in days four through six, God then fills the things he separated with his creation. In days, day four, he fills the, the, the light and the darkness with the sun, the moon, and the stars, right? Uh, day, day two, he made the water and the sky where he fills it with fish and birds in day five. And then day three, he created the land and the sea. And day six, he fills the land with animals and humans, right? And then as day one, uh, you know, he, he started to create day seven, it says God rested from that creating. God, by the way, was not tired from what we know of the God of the Bible. It was a sense the artist's creation was complete. There was nothing left to do, right? And that's why we, yeah, I think also God says it was very good. And so as you look at this literary structure, you start to see these patterns uh, that start to develop. You know, like I said, God separates in days one through three, and he fills in days four through six. And so in one sense, day one corresponds to day four. Day two corresponds to day five. Day three corresponds to day six. I would have put the little lines with my iPad, but I, I couldn't figure it out. It looked terrible, so I didn't do that for you. But you can, day one to four, day two to five, day three to six, you can, you can figure uh, that out, hopefully. And, and so it, it's this idea of poetry uh, that the Jews uh, use called a chiasm. And it's this idea that, that if you drew a line down the middle of this story and you folded it, it would kind of fold upon itself. It would have these kind of two bookends, and that would be God starting to create and God resting from his creation. And as you folded those, this chiasm, this poem, on itself, it would kind of all just match up. It would mirror itself, and that's kind of this literary term uh, called chiasm. And if you're familiar with the Bema podcast, you're going, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's a great uh, uh, Christian kind of Jewish view of, you know, it's really a, cri a Christian presentation from a very Jewish standpoint uh, by a guy named Marty Solomon. And some of this I certainly uh, would credit to him. I, you know, I've learned, but it's the, it's the third, it's the third podcast in the first season. If you want to dig a little bit more deeply into some of this, we're going to be talking about uh, today. And so this idea of a chiasm uh, is, is what kind of uh, this Many scholars uh, believe the poetry here is all about this. Um, and this is a tool that, that Easterners used in their literature. Uh, so the, the first part of the story mirrors the last part of the story. And that's the idea of you can kind of fold it up upon uh, itself. So you either, you either have, as you can see on the screen, A, B, C, D, and then D, C, B, A. That's one way to do it. Um, or you have a parallelism, A, B, C, D, and then again, A, B, C, D. And we'll look here in a moment. Genesis chapter 1 actually has both of these kinds of chiasms, if you will, uh, within it. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here, and I'll give you a visual help with that uh, uh, in a moment. Um, and so a chiasm, you know, visually can be shaped like an hourglass. And that's the, that's the one, that's the one on, on, on your left, right? Or it can be shaped visually like a diamond. And so it, it kind of condenses toward the middle, then it comes back out. Or it, or it kind of starts to develop wider and wider, then it comes back in. And that's kind of the mirror. You can kind of see the mirror uh, in the hourglass uh, and, and, and the diamond shapes. But in the middle, what it's supposed to do is point you to the middle. And in the middle is the treasure, again, Eastern thinking. In the middle is the, is the picture of what you're supposed to really grasp. The most important thing is in the middle of the chiasm. That's the treasure. That's the, that's the ah, now I get what God is trying to say here, kind of moment, that Genesis 1, if you look at it from a Hebrew and a literary standpoint, which we often don't do, unfortunately, these days, you can start to kind of see what is God trying to get at in, in the moon and the stars and the birds and the bees and all, you know, all these things. And, you know, what is going on here? Evening, morning, the, the third day, well, you know, what is going on? And so it's an incredibly well put together piece of literature. Um, and again, you can see it. You can see the, the patterns. Uh, you have smaller to medium to large sections of Scripture, then large back to medium, back to small sections of Scripture, you know, the paragraphs. Um, uh, this, 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 this one kind of helps you see it a little bit better, a little bit more clearly. You can kind of see, you know, kind of the different ideas color-coded here and how they kind of get small, then a little bit bigger, then really big, and then they kind of come back out. Um, but there's also, if you look at the whole Hebrew structure, and you count the extra Hebrew words, the very middle word, the very middle word, uh, right there, uh, right in the middle of that second line there, I, 
I tried to highlight it. It's festivals there, festivals. Um, uh, but that's actually, another way to translate that word is actually uh, uh, sacred times. The old NIV, I think, says festivals in verse 14. Uh, but the new NIV actually says sacred, sacred times. Sacred times. Um, and, and so it's really, it's really quite interesting. That's the very middle of this whole structure. That, that, that word, it's moad in, in, in the Hebrew, and it means festivals or, or sacred times. And it's a word very closely associated with the, the Hebrew word Sabbath, this idea of rest that God started on the seventh day here, uh, you know, in, in the creation account. And so hopefully you're following this. Some of you are just like, man, I'm not ready to think this early in the morning. ASU students, I know this is easy for you guys. It's so simple, so simple. You're, you're with me 100%, I'm sure. Uh, but, but, but hopefully you can kind of start to see this idea of a picture and a pattern and that God is trying to drive home a point perhaps in, this, in the middle of this chiasm with this, this Hebrew word moad in the center. Um, and you can see kind of the bookends. You know, the gold is on the end. That's kind of the bookends of, of God started creating and God rested from uh, his creation. And so if you count the words moad, lines up right in the center, uh, as I said there, and that's uh, on, on, your, uh, on your left there, uh, the, the word moad there. Um, time, you know, sacred times is probably a more accurate translation uh, you know, of that Hebrew word. But what's interesting is it shows up again in Leviticus 23. In Leviticus 23, there on the screen in verses 1 through 2, toward the end of the Pentateuch, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals, moad. The appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. And then what's the first one mentioned in verse 3? The Sabbath. The Sabbath, right? And the Sabbath in the Jewish mindset is this idea, just like as God did in day 7, you're, you're resting, you're not working, you're slowing down and you're enjoying God. And you're enjoying your, 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 your family, you're, you're enjoying all the things God has created in life. And that's why you're, you're discouraged from working. So you can really enjoy and slow down and appreciate all that God has done. So, so the treasure, uh, if you will, the, the treasure in Genesis 1, if you look at the literary structure, is deeply connected to sacred time and rest, this idea of Moad. So if you break down the chiasms, Moad or Moed, it, it, it can go either way, uh, translated into English, is the treasure in the middle of this story. And some of you who love taking naps go, amen, I know exactly what God's talking about in Genesis chapter 1. I love my naps, you know. And, uh, but there is something very spiritual, something very important in our identities that, that have to, has to do with slowing down and just understanding what life is really all about. And, and when it comes to our identities, this is very important. God designed us with intent, and one of the intents of his creation was that we would slow down and enjoy the life that he has given us. And, and, and again, if you go back to Genesis 1, you see this again because a Jewish day is mentioned over and over in Genesis chapter 1. Every time it mentions the days, it says there was evening and there was morning the first day. And every time it has that phrase, there was evening, there was morning the second day, and, and so on and so forth, all through, all through the passage. So in God's economy... The day starts when you rest, not when you work. Now, I know in, again, modern Western world, we don't, you know, Walmart never shuts down, but that's not the way it all started. Again, Amer our American thinking messes us up really quick, but God, God's design was that you would start with realizing what your life is about, slowing down and realizing you're meant to be with God and walk with God and enjoy the life that God has given you. And then what's also interesting is the seventh day does not have that phrase, evening and morning. Look at it. The seventh day, at the end of uh, chapter 1 into, into chapter 2, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing in verse 2 in chapter 2. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on, on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And so Genesis 2, 2 through 3 does not have evening, morning, the seventh day. And the rabbis, some of them teach that it's as if the author is deliberately hanging the seventh day out there endlessly with no refrain, no cap. The seventh day goes on forever because it's God's invitation to you and I. 
So, so you start to kind of see more and more clearly the treasure in all this is, is really, you know, our relationship with God and enjoying that. And that, that's what we were designed for. That's what we were created for, right? Uh, you know, in, uh, in many ways. And, and so this, this poem structure, the, the bookends of creation, and the treasure in the middle, the Moad, I think reveal perhaps the two biggest components as humans that we should relate to in our identity. And it's just the two things. And this is the case I want to make to you today from the Bible. That our identity lies mostly and primarily in from God as humans, the idea of creation and the idea of rest. Hopefully you can see that from what we've kind of looked at here uh, in Genesis chapter 1, that, that creation and rest are, are two of the foundational things that as humans we should find our identity in. But if you think about how, how you would say an answer to the question, who am I, do you think of that? I don't naturally necessarily think of that. But that's built into Genesis chapter 1 in a very clever and clear way. And my summary would be this from Genesis 1. We are made by a God who wants us to find our true identity in fulfilling and enjoying our lives. That there's an intent that, that, that should be fulfilling and enjoyable in our lives. And the context, again, is really important as you, as you look at, at, at the Pentateuch, because the Pentateuch, genera, gen, the first five books of the Bible, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, was given to the Israelites, most people think, from Moses. And when Moses would have given this to the Israelites, it was probably after they left Egypt. And, and maybe we think maybe he even did this at Mount Sinai through God, because God spoke a lot to Moses, and Moses spoke a lot to his people and even chiseled the tablets right at Mount Sinai uh, in the book of Exodus, it records. Um, and so why is that context also important? Well, what were the Israelites doing in Egypt? They were slaves for 400 plus years. And so where did they find their identity? Where did they find their value? It wasn't work. How many days a week did they work? Seven. Seven days a week. And, and if you didn't work... You're going to maybe lose your identity, period, right? And so, so Egypt was just drilled into the Israelites. And then all of a sudden they're out of there and God is like, you need to understand your value is not in what you do, but in who you are. And he's preaching that through Moses. And it's the first thing God records in Scripture. Why? So we can, so we can figure out how old the earth is. No, I don't think that's what Genesis 1 is really about. It's to help us to figure out our true identity through God. And Christian or not, this is a very important thing for you to consider as a human. We live in a culture that is similar to Egypt. The bigger, the better, the faster we can make quote-unquote bricks, the better we're told to feel about ourselves, right? That's the culture we live in. We live in Egypt in a lot of ways in America. Work, work, work. I, I know people who brag to me, and I've even heard it in this church and other churches they bragged to me, oh, yeah, I don't take my vacation time. And the older I get, the more I, I think that's a sad view of your life. You need some Moab. You need some Sabbath there, bro. Slow down. Slow down. In America, it's so easy to get our identity from the stuff we own, the size of our bank accounts, our careers. You meet somebody. I, I do this. I'm guilty of it myself. You know, oh, hey, nice to meet you. What do you do? This is often one of the first questions I ask people. And again, we're going to talk about this as we close out here. We do get some of our identity from the work God's called us to do. So I'm not saying that work is not meaningful, but there's a fine line there, right? To, to get in our meaning from, from who God made us to be rather than what we do. And so I think this is very relevant for us as we kind of dive into this idea of finding our true identity in God. And the other interesting thing as Christians you know, thousands of years removed from this, this, uh, this when this was written down, you know, American Christianity can kind of narrow, American Christianity can narrow down our identity to you are sinners saved by grace. And that, that's part, that's a foundational truth under the New Testament that we are sinners saved by grace. I don't mean to say that that's false, but that's a very narrow view of our identity in Christ. A very narrow and limited view. And at some point can become a very faulty view. And so we can get lazy in our theology and messaging and it creates a false identity 
And I think an evil, an evil view of identity that we are bad people from our creation. When Genesis 1.31 said humans were made on the sixth day by God, and he said it was very good. So they can't both be true. They can't both be true. And original sin and things like that have developed from, I think, some of this faulty and limited theology. And we do sin. And so in some sense, you know, as humans, we are part sinner. But sin, according to Genesis 1, I don't think is really the foundational part of our identities. Sin to me is when our identities get off track and start to get messed up. We become less and less human the more and more we sin. And that's why, that's why Jesus came to save sinners by grace, is to, is, to, is to restore their identity. And so that's where I think Christ can connect us better to the story here in Genesis chapter 1. And next week we're going to look at false identity the lies that we believe, and we're going to talk more, much more about sin, because we will have to tackle that. Sin is a real thing we have to deal with, because it messes up our identity. But the good news is, Jesus came to perfect. He came to perfect our identity. He, he is your identity insurance through and through, amen? And he came to help us, I think, deal with our sin, so that we can find and restore our true identities. And, and when you start thinking about the New Testament that way, Scriptures start to come to life in a new way, I think. For example, with Jesus and our identity, in 1 John 3, 1 through 6, I was reading this passage, a sister quoted it to me recently, in a time uh, we were talking, and, and uh, I, this changed my whole view of this passage. In, in 1 John 3, 1 through 6, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. Isn't that Genesis chapter 1? That we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The identity gets all messed up because we don't really know God, right? Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Our identity will not be completed fully until Christ returns. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in, in him purify themselves. The idea of fighting for our holiness just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared, referring to Christ, so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Does that literally mean that you have no sin if you're a Christian? No, I think what it means is it's more about our foundations, our identity. If we're truly in him, our, 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 our identity is totally being transformed where there is no sin in the eyes of God through that grace and through that blood that was poured out on the cross that we just celebrated. And he goes on to say, practically no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. And that's what's sad about a Christian who, who has been redeemed and, and, and their identity is starting to be cleaned up by Christ, and then they go right back, right back to the false views of themselves and the false views that the world gives us, and they start to mess up their identity. And that should motivate us to repent, amen, because we want to live out our true identity. So Jesus came to help us restore and recover our true identity that we see here in Genesis chapter 1. In him is no sin. In other words, our truest identity can be found through Christ, through his redemptive work on the cross. We start to restore our true identity. And yes, it's only completed perfectly when he returns, but it can grow more and more as we get more and more pure and more and more holy uh, in him. And that's why as a church right now we're working on discipling. And that's why discipling is important. This idea of helping each other to be more like Christ. Because we're helping each other to be more and more of our truest selves. We're helping each other to be more and more of, of that identity that God wants to bring out in all of our lives. And so this whole idea that, that we're just sinners is, is, a, is, is a very faulty foundational view of your identity. And it contradicts what God said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. And again, we'll look at more of that theology uh, next week for sure. And so Jesus can help us get a much better view of ourselves, but also I think he can also help us to view work in a much healthier way. Um, the upside of this is Jesus helping us in our identity when it comes to work. Uh, back to the text here in Genesis 1. We're going to start landing the plane here soon. But it's a little bit of a study, a little, little bit of a, of a think, think tank here this morning together. Um, in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us, hints of the Trinity there, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's fully revealed 
in the New Testament. Let us, and that would include Jesus, make mankind in our image, in our likeness. In Genesis 1, uh, verse 26. Um, and then in, it says in verse 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then you go to, to the New Testament and you see the same idea. In Colossians 1, verse 15, the Son, referring to Jesus, is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So we are made in Jesus' image. From a Christian viewpoint, we could say that. And so what's kind of cool is, is in every human in this room, there's a little bit of Jesus. I don't know if you knew that about yourself. But there's a little bit of Jesus in every one of us because we're made in his image. Because he's part, part and fully God himself. And our true identity is discovered further as we work toward that image in Christ. It's like, we're, it's like we're mining as we repent, as we grow, as we help each other, as we hear sermons, as we, as we get enlightened. You know, from Genesis chapter 1, we're mining and we're working toward more and more and more. That, that true image starts to come out more and more and more. A little bit of Jesus starts coming out more and more and more. And that is a good thing. Amen. And so to me, you know, you could say all humans are artists. All humans are creative because we're made in, in, our, in, our, in our father and, and, and in his son's image. And what were they doing in Genesis chapter 1? You know, making, you know, making stars and making blue whales and making, making mountains and sunsets, you know? I mean, that's incredible. And we, we have a little bit of that inside of us. You know, the lake day was awesome. Uh, you know, I camped uh, over here uh, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, right side here. Oh, oh dear. Get me back up to that picture when you can't. Oh, there we are. I thought I had the, oh, no, I don't have that. That's the stop button. That's the highlight button. Okay, thank you. Over here, this is me and, and my daughter Eva there on, on the, in the shade um, and my dog, one of my dogs, Booker there. Um, and that's our little pop-up camper. And that's the Superstition Mountain back there and Cactus. And, and that's my 2003 Chevy Suburban. Why am I pointing out all this? Well... I'm not bragging because they're both kind of, you know, pieces of junk, the, the, the trailer and the car. But, uh, um, but what I love about this is, is the engineering, the human creativity to get me in that climate-controlled chassis that can haul that trailer, you know, just, just the engineering behind that to be able to build a vehicle like that. And I do love my Suburban, don't get me wrong. But to be able to build something like that is just incredible when you start to think about it. I mean, I get a flat tire, and I'm like, I don't know how to fix this. You know, it's just because humans are made in the image of God. We are creative geniuses, you know, in one sense. And then this trailer, it, it, all, it all pops down. Oh, geez. It all pops down, and, and I can fit it inside my garage. You know, it's like, it's like a pop-up tent, you know. And, and again, you know, the creativity. And then over here, you know, Don G and Terry, and, you know, they set up this whole table at the lake day. You can see right here, these are two water bottles taped together. There's a propeller right there. There's batteries on the top. So they even took, like, humans created plastic and it's junk and made it into something. It's a little boat for the kids to play with at the lake, you know? It's just, so a little bit of that was Don and some other people, I'm sure, who thought of that. But it's just amazing. It's amazing to think, you know, God is a creator and humans are also creators. We, we are also creators. And so Jesus, he's trying to make us more and more the da Vinci, more and more the Van Gogh that we were meant to be. And that, that is an exciting thing. Church should be a, a training school for you to become the best version of yourself. Church should be a place where our true identities come out more and more in Christ. And part of that identity is our work. Those things that we are meant to accomplish, uh, you know, in the earth and in this life. And it makes me think of, uh, you know, Ephesians 2, uh, verses 8 through 10. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And that's why we need that rest, right? For it says in verse 10, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But again, the world wants you to get all your identity through your work. The world, the world teaches you to get all your identity through your work and, and, and your value and your bank account and, and your social media platform, right? And, and for me, before I became a Christian, that's what I was being fed. You know, be successful was a big thing that I was being fed. That was a big part of my identity. That's why I, you know, was uh, president of the National Honor Society and 
graduated valedictorian and, you know, was secretary of my class and because I had to be successful, you know, and well, it was mostly for my college resume, too. But, uh, but it's funny, then I got to university and, and, and it's like, be successful, be successful. And I was so empty and I was so lacking purpose. And I just thought, so you just keep got to be, you just got to keep being successful? Like, when does that end, you know? I, you know I, it was just very confusing. That's the American version of our identity in many ways, right? And it makes people very empty and very lost. But then I became a Christian, praise God, in 1995. And I met my creator, and he taught me about my creativity and what it was really meant for. And when I became a Christian, what I realized is the greatest are the servants among us all. Jesus said, those are the greatest. And then I realized, okay, well, i got to serve, but what are my gifts? And the church helped me figure out my gifts are in leadership. And then I started serving in leadership. And, and that's led me to eventually be, be appointed as an evangelist. And, and now I get to come and I get to, I get to help God help you figure out to be the best version of yourself as I preach his word, as I, as I train leaders and so on and so forth. And, I, and how amazing is that? How redemptive, how redemptive is God's work when we really, really do it God's way? And that's a huge part. That's a huge part of your identity in Christ. He helps us really bring that out. In closing here, uh, you know, Marty Solomon uh, on, on the, uh, the Bema podcast, uh, he, he's talking about Genesis 1, uh, and he says this. He says, the first lesson in the scripture tells us what is most fundamentally true about creation, that it's good, that when God made it, he rejoiced over it and enjoyed it, and he invites us still today, even in the midst of its brokenness, to do the same thing, to remember what's most true about creation and what's most true about us. It's the lie that we want to buy into the other six days out of the week that, right, that gets in the way. And he says, I think it's also a posture we carry through life. We either live in a posture of fear and insecurity. We don't have enough and we're not enough. And we just keep doing because God's angry at us and God's mad at us. But Genesis 1 says God's not angry at creation. God's not mad at creation. God's not inflicting chaos. God loves creation. God rejoices over creation. It was good. It was good. It was very good. God rejoices over creation. That affects my posture in life. And then he concludes, if I believe that God really feels good about creation and values and accepts and loves me, it changes my posture from one of scarcity to one of abundance. And, th and that is my hope as we, as we dig into the scripture and we really dis try to discover more and more our true identity that we'll, we'll, we'll get less and less from that scarcity in our faith and more and more toward that abundance in our faith. And this might reframe some very familiar passages that we read in Christ. When he says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. It doesn't mean you sit around and do nothing. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is our ultimate Sabbath. Amen. For my yoke is easy, he says, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty 20 through 30. Again, in John 10, verses 9 through 10, Jesus says, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. You're not, you're not sitting around doing nothing, but when you really come in and go in through him, you find pasture. And then he concludes, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it to the full. And so this week, I really want to encourage us uh, to make some truth inquiries. So, so, some truth inquiries on our identity, based on what we've studied today. I want you to really think about this. Uh, we're practicing discipling right now. I'd love for you to bring this to some of your, your Christ-centered discipling times, uh, you know, as a church. Uh, and if you're new to us, I want you to really think about this, Christian or not. These are foundational human questions that all atheists and all people who believe in some kind of God all have. And we've answered, I think, some of those questions with Genesis chapter 1 today and some of the words that we looked at uh, from Jesus. The first question here to consider, how can the chiasm, the treasure in Genesis 1, think of the, you know, the hourglass and the diamond, 
that we were created very good and in the image of God, how can that better help you find your true identity in this season of life? Because some of us are, are, are working professionals who are single. Some of us are, are married, you know, couples with small children. Some of us are campus students. Some of us are teenagers. Some of us, you know, are already starting to identify through, too much through that and not through God. I, I got us off track, but we're all at different places, different seasons. But, but where, what's God trying to teach you about your true identity in this particular season? All that's going on, on outside of you, but especially what, what, what is he trying to create in you? And so that's under kind of the creation side. And then the other question to consider in the rest is what parts of God's created life, you know, think Sabbath, think that which you enjoy. For me, lately, my Sabbath is I go out on my mountain bike out to War Paint Trail over in Aotuki, and I ride my bike amongst the saguaros and the big rocks, and, and then I find this little sh- rock that's all shaded from the sun. And I go after I'm worn out from my bike ride, I listen to podcasts, I pray while I'm riding, and then I go sit on that rock, and I'm just trying to enjoy God. Not think about, I gotta do this and I gotta do that and I gotta go here and I, gotta, I just wanna sit there and enjoy my relationship with God. Think about that. Something like that for you, it might be totally opposite of mine. What parts of God's created life do you most enjoy? And how might this help you better find your identity in Christ? So, some questions to consider today. Let's talk about it after church. I'm sure God's already putting stuff in your heart. Uh, if you're new to us, please reach out to those who have invited you and get, and get tied into us and help us help you discover your true identity in Christ as we grow in this journey as well. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll close out now with some announcements and some worship. Thank you for letting me go a little long today. Father in heaven, uh, we come before you, uh, and we just want to thank you uh, that Genesis 1 shows us that you, you love us, you, you value us, you, you believe in us. You created us, God, and you rejoiced over that. You said we were, the, we were the best part of your whole creation. You know, the stars and the moon and the, the animals and the mountains and the oceans, they, they, they didn't bring you the joy, God, that we brought you as the pinnacle of your creation. But God, we know in our, in our true identity, we, 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 we get lost, we get confused, we get stuck. And we pray, God, as we are on this journey for the next five weeks of discovering our true identity in Christ, that that you can help us to, to seek truth over lies. You know, if, if, if people in the room today, God, who don't know you, who are new to us, God, or, or just confused in this journey, God, please speak to them. Please speak truth to them. Please get rid of the lies that Satan, their enemy, is bringing to them. And please help them, God, find the ultimate truth in Christ if they've not found yet that truth as a Christian. And for the Christians in the room, God, I pray that we will not buy into the, the religious lies the, uh, the self-inflicted lies, God, that we can oftentimes bring, that we can continue to dig into our true identity in creation and in rest that we have, we have looked at and started to discover in Genesis 1 and through Jesus' incredible words and life that he lived. We thank you, God. Uh, please help us to answer the question of who I am over the next few weeks in a very biblical and Christ-like way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.